Making It Work is brought to you by the Max Dupree Center for Leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary and the Theology of Work Project. Welcome to Making It Work. Through conversation, scripture, and stories, we invite God into work's biggest challenges so that you can live out your purpose in the workplace. I'm Mark Roberts. And I'm Leah Archibald. And this is Making It Work. You've just said it to your spouse or to your coworker, or maybe you yelled it into the air above you. There are not enough hours in the day. Your to-do list feels like it's never ending and new requests keep coming into your inbox. Meanwhile, your phone is vibrating with alerts and maybe you have to drive somewhere to pick something up and you feel like it's already halfway through the day. Where has all the time gone? If this is how you feel, you are not alone. Today, we're going to talk about how to get a handle back on your time with God. Our guest, Jordan Rayner, is someone who knows a lot about being busy. He's a serial entrepreneur, now the executive chairman of Threshold 360, a tech startup which he formerly ran as CEO. And Jordan is also an author of a number of books, including Redeeming Your Time, Seven Biblical Principles for Being Purposeful, Present, and Wildly Productive. Jordan Rayner, welcome to the Making It Work podcast. Lee and Mark, it's a joy to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. So Jordan, I'm glad you're with us today because this is actually one of the biggest questions that we get from listeners. How can I do more Mm. with less time? So Mm. let's start off by asking that, is that question even possible? Can we do more with less time? I think it is possible, right? Because the Apostle Paul commanded us to do it. You know, after a long exposition on the gospel of grace in Ephesians, he gets to Ephesians 5, uh, Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. And as he always does, he's anticipating his reader's question of, okay, Paul, I get it. I'm saved to do good works in this world. How do I respond to the gospel? How do I do this? And he says, it is possible. He says, see then that you walk carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. In other words, we're running out of time to do the work God's called us to do in this world. And so it is possible. I have seen myself be able to, by God's grace, redeem some of my time and have a fairly productive career these first 10 or 12 years of my career. And more importantly, I've seen the Lord use this book, this content, change people's lives, right? To make them more purposeful, present, and productive in the image of what I think we see in Christ and how he stewarded his time in the gospel biographies. So this is where the title of your book comes from, Redeeming Your Time. It comes from this verse in Ephesians chapter 5. So what is that? What does it mean to you to redeem your time? What does that mean in regards to your work? Yeah, it's a great question. So the word here, if you look it up in any uh, concordance, it really means to buy up or to ransom, right? Mm -hmm. Paul's saying that time management isn't this secular thing. It's a bit, Tim Tim Keller commenting on this verse says it's a biblical command. We are called to roll up our sleeves and buy back as much time as we can. Now here's where this diverges from, from, from conventional business thinking on this topic. We're not called to time management so that we can make ourselves rich and famous. The reason why we care about really? redeeming our time, so <laughs> shocker, right? <laughs> we care so that we can do more good works that bring God glory. See Matthew 5, 16, so we can create for his eternal kingdom. See 1 Corinthians 15, 58, so we can make disciples and impress the Lord's on our on the hearts of our children. See Deuteronomy 6, and just enjoy God and his good blessings, right? We redeem our time, not for our own glory, not for success. Success isn't the idea. We do it for God's glory and service to others. So can you give an example from your life of what, what does that look like in practical terms to redeem your time? Yeah, I mean, the the book really spells that out in about 60,000 words, right? <laughs> it, it, looks, it looks multifaceted. It looks like, uh, you know, perhaps ironically, resting more 
so that I can be more productive. It means taking time to descent from the kingdom of noise so that I can think clearly and hear the Lord's voice as I'm trying to prioritize my to-do list. Those are just a couple of the examples uh, of, of the principles that I outlined in the book that really make way to the super practical content there. Mark, I want to bring you into this conversation because, you know, when I was reading Jordan's book, I was thinking, redeeming my time is a different way of thinking about it. Is there something um, about the language of the Ephesians that we should really get back to in our uh, conversations about time these days? You know, that, 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 you know, that's an interesting question because, you know, the, the verse says redeeming the time because the days are evil. So there's a sense in which it's like life is going on out there and, and, and it's not good. But if I make a good choice about my life and my actions, in a way, I'm like, I'm like buying a piece of that time out of the slavery to evil into goodness. And that's kind of cool. Mark, it's really good. What I think of when I think of this term redeeming and, and, and Paul saying that the days are evil, we have a real enemy who is trying to thwart the effectiveness of God's people. Right. And one of the ways he does that is by distractions, is by making our world noisy, about making, uh, by making our world chaotic and robbing some of these minutes from us. So when I think about redeeming, it's like fighting back against these things so that we can reclaim, buy up, ransom, redeem some of that time and use it for the purposes uh, by which God has called us to in this life. Yeah, that's a that's a great way to put it. By by the way, we should just mention if there are listeners who are looking in their Bible and they're saying, "Yeah, I can't find that verse." Uh, the, redeem, the redeeming the time language it, that's a, a very literal translation, and that's the King James version. Correct. Most modern versions say something like "making the most of the time" there or "using every opportunity," and that's the idea. But just in case you're puzzled, like, where is he getting this? It, it, that's a what very Ephesians little... What 5.16 is Jordan yeah. reading? Yeah, yeah. It's, it is the King James translation, but it's a very literal. And the thing I, I love about that older translation is the richness of it. So, yes, it's about making the most of the time. But that's a kind of a prosaic way to put it. Redeeming the time really gets at it. And it's the thing you just said, Jordan. It, it gets at this idea that we can actually, like, claim something that that's not good and and make it good really mm -hmm. by the way we we claim it and redeem it so it, mm -hmm. it's a, just a, a richer way to think about it mm -hmm. this leads into you know a piece of practical advice that I want you to get at Jordan you give a lot of practical advice in this book I have to say so for example, one of the pieces of advice you give um, is about needing to break the addiction to the news cycle <laughs> and to your smartphone. Yeah. And uh, like turning off the smartphone alerts, turning off the number of times that you check news in order to be productive. Mm -hmm. So like, tell me how this worked in your life. Yeah, no, this is a great question. And I think this is a good opportunity to introduce kind of how I wrote the book. So there are... These seven principles, I think when you look at the Gospels for the biographies that they are, you can see at least seven principles that, that you see in the life of Christ of how he manages time. And what I've done is I've expounded upon those seven principles and then connected them to 32, as you say, wicked, to use Boston language, wicked <laughs> practical uh, practices to help us live those out in the 21st century. For example, when you look at the gospel biographies, Jesus, the amount of times Jesus, as I say, dissented from the kingdom of noise is staggering. He was always found in solitary places, in lonely places, right? And that just stands in stark contrast to us today. We're constantly consuming news. We're constantly on our smartphones, responding to messages, in, in taking information. And I just don't think that we can think clearly be creative and listen to God's voice and thus prioritize the work that he's given us to do if we're constantly intaking new information. News is great. Information is great. But at some point, you got to turn it off and just sit still and think, 
right? Uh, so that we can not just be efficient, but that we can be effective in how we're using our time. So there have been a lot of things, uh, lots of things in my life that have led me to those practices, but primarily it's been in just looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John through this lens of saying, okay, Jesus had 33 years on this earth. He had 24 hours a day, the same 24 hours uh, that you and I have today. How did he steward his time? Those led to the principles and the principles then in turn led to all all of those practices. Yeah, but he didn't have an iPhone. That's exactly I mean, (laughs) I mean, Mark, tell me, is it really comparable, um, the times that Jesus was living in and the distractions that we have now? Do you you back up, Jordan, on this point? Well, I, I would. I would just say it's a whole lot worse now. And the temptations to be distracted are so much greater. I mean, I've, I've experienced that even, you know, I'm not as old as, I mean, I wasn't around when Jesus was there, but I've been around for a while. And it was actually, it was about maybe six or seven years ago where it occurred to me that my ability to pay attention to my work for longer periods of time had pretty much disappeared. And that was really a, a kind of a chilling discovery and realization. And I realized it had everything to do with the, the interruptions that would appear on my computer. Every time I got a new email, you know, the little number comes up. Uh, every every text message, every I had all these notifications. And I realized that I had, I had really changed the wiring of my brain. And it was very chilling to me. And I had to make some pretty tough choices, which, by the way, it, it, Jordan, I, I really appreciate your stuff on this because it's like you're a cheerleader for these choices and I'm pretty good at them now, but there's always the temptation to go back to being just continually interruptible. And what we do so see about Jesus- what did you have to do, Mark? Did you have to set like clear disciplines on um, how often you would check your- it, Yes, email? and it's almost embarrassing what I had to do. Literally, there are various apps you can put on your computer to sort of help you to do this. Uh, for example, there's an, some of it's just a timer app. And one of the things I said is I'm only going to check my email. At, at first, it was every two hours. And that was a hard thing to do. I, I, you know, I had to rewire my brain. But I had this little, this little reminder thing. So at two hours, a little, the little wolf would howl. And then that's like, okay, now I can check my email. And I, I mean, really, I feel kind of embarrassed, but I needed to get back. It was like, you know, I used to be able to play the piano well, but I, I was so out of, out of practice. I had to go back to scales and really relearn things. And so I've, I've taken almost all notifications off my technology. Uh, Jordan, one of the things he t- you talk about is, you know, you can prioritize certain people and the technology can let yeah. them get through, which is important yeah. and good. But, but I'll, I'll be honest, I, I have to fight the urge to distract myself all the time. And that for me is, yeah, they're distractions and they're externals. And Jordan, you talk about external, yeah. but you know what? It's, it's the part of me that wants the, the excitement of the external that yeah. I've really got to manage. The, 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 the very literal dopamine hit yeah. that occurs when you check your phone and find a new text message or a new yep. social media, like I want to say one more thing, going back to the example of Jesus, I want to clarify something uh, that I say in the book. Of course, Jesus's distractions in the first centuries don't compare to ours. But we got to be really careful of chronological snobbery here, right? Mm. Jesus was clearly distracted. There was one time a guy literally dropped through the roof over <laughs> Jesus' head as he was preaching. <laughs> Yeah. If you've never that had somebody drop, off your train of thought, yeah, it's like if you've never had somebody drop through the roof while you were typing away at a proposal, you're not more distracted than Jesus was. Sure, the distractions are different, but again, right. we got to beware of this chronological stuff. You know, now, to Mark's point, go ahead. Yeah, that's sorry, good. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that that's good because there are many places in the Gospels where Jesus is doing stuff, and you know, all the sick people from the area are coming to him. Now, I got to say, that'd be even harder than to to not, you know, to ignore a text, right? Because now you have people in need far beyond your capacity to deal with them. 
Yes. That would be a tough. Literally in your face, not in your pocket. Uh, Yeah. But going back to what Mark said, Mark, uh, you said you felt embarrassed. Man, you shouldn't because all of us struggle with this. And you're right now, one of the greatest threats to our ability to do the work God's called us to do are external distractions, i.e. nonstop emails, nonstop texts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Let let me give an analogy to try to paint the picture of where we're at culturally. Um, Imagine if the mailman, instead of coming to your house once a day, started coming 150 (laughs) times a day. Mm. But here's where this gets crazier, right? He doesn't stay at the curb. He comes to your front door, rings the doorbell, and you drop whatever you're doing, open the door, grab the mail. Maybe you open it, maybe you don't, but you at least steal a glance at who it's from. We would check you into an insane asylum. But that is exactly what we're doing with text messages and email today. So real practically, I'm going to walk you through one of the 32 practices in the book. Here's how you can solve this problem. Here's how you can solve this problem. Three steps. Mark already alluded to some of it. Step one. You choose when you're going to check your messages every day, not the crazy mailman, right? Mm -hmm. And what matters way more than the number of times you check your messages is that you choose when you're going to check them. So for Mark, it's checking email every two hours. Great. If that works for you, awesome. If you need to check it every hour, that's fine, but you're in control. That's step one. Step two, you want to build a list of VIPs who can have access to you anytime, not just at the times you're checking messages. So for me, my VIPs are my wife, my kid's school, my assistant, a few members of my team. That's about it. And then once you have your list of VIPs, add them to the favorites list on your iPhone or your people list on an Android device, turn on do not disturb, and then calls from those people and those people alone will come through when you're trying to do your deep work throughout the day. Last step, Mm -hmm. step three. You've chosen when you're going to check your messages. You've built your VIPs. Now you've got to set clear expectations with those VIPs. You send a very simple message. Hey, I'm trying to be more focused at home and at work. So from now on, I'm only checking email and texts at X, Y, and Z times. But you're a VIP. So if you need me urgently, don't text, don't email, call my cell phone, and I'll pick up every single time. If you do those three steps... I can almost guarantee you, you're never going to miss anything that's truly urgent and you're going to be doing your work way faster and with a heck of a lot less anxiety. I I love that. I think sometimes when I read a time management book, I feel more stressed as I'm (laughs) reading it because there's this heavy dose of shame that comes along with it. Like, oh, the author knows what they're doing and I don't know. And, And you don't dish that out on the reader, I think because you start with the framework of grace. Mm. That our time is a gift from God and God wants to partner with us in our work. And you know what? If we don't get everything on our to-do list done, that's okay. Yes. You know, we're still going to be beloved by God. And there's oh, there's always going to be things left undone, right? That's not for us to control. Our, our job is to do the best that we can, you know, with the time that we've been given. So I think, I like, I appreciate your positive energy, both in this, you know, tidbit that you shared with us and in your book, because I don't feel like a terrible person, mm you know, reading your book, like when Mark said, oh, it's confession time. I have to confess, you know, that I, <laughs> that I, you know, set a, used an app to yeah. help me check my email um, only two hours. I think, you know, we all have those. Yeah. You know, we all have this sense of failure because there's so much to do and because the external and internal distractions are so big. Yes. You know, so I think we all, we can all get down on ourselves um, if we don't have that sense of grace that you bring to this project. Yeah, and listen, there are 60,000 time management books on Amazon right now, which is just a silly number, right? (laughs) And I've read, let's call it the top 50 perennial sellers in this category. A lot of those books you were referring to, Leah, and this is why I wrote Redeeming Your Time. Because I was tired of reading, but as helpful as those books are, we, we got to recognize common grace and, and, and the Lord's ability to communicate truth through believers and non-believers. But it is, as helpful as those books were, they were all based on works-based productivity. 
you know, the implicit message was, hey, if you're feeling swamped or you're feeling overwhelmed, follow the author system perfectly, do exercises X, Y, and Z, and then you're going to find peace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, listen, the Apostle Paul tells me I already have peace. Romans 5, 1, I, through Christ, I have ultimate peace with God. So I don't do time management exercises on this wild goose chase to get peace that I can't attain in my own strength. Anyways, I do it as a worshipful response to the peace that has already been graciously given to me, right? And because that's the foundation, I can have grace with myself when I don't finish my to-do list, when I do check email more than once every other hour, uh, when I don't get my coveted eight hours of sleep, because I know that I don't need to be productive. I want to be productive. The gospel compels me to be productive. This is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, but I don't need to because regardless of what I do, I'm a beloved child of God. Hmm. Now, I wonder, do you think it's the pressures are different across different industry or maybe perhaps with different class of yeah, workers? No you know, are people in different professions facing different um, time management challenges? Oh, no question. Different time management challenges. And by the way, that message I just shared, it's great that God doesn't need me to finish my to-do list, but... There's varying degrees of pressure for your boss, Mm. from your boss for you to finish your to-do list uh, based on where you're at in your career and in socioeconomic class. You bring up an important point that I I haven't talked about in the book, but I want to bring up here, you know, as leaders, just talking specifically to leaders of organizations right now, you know, it, it can be easy to approach any book like this and say, what can I get out of this? How can I redeem my time? I think the redemptive, the sacrificial thing is to think about how can I use these principles to help my team redeem their time? Recognizing that if they work less, not only are they going to flourish, but it's also going to make the organization more productive. Recognizing that not only do I want a Sabbath, but man, even if I'm not convicted of the Sabbath, I should probably Sabbath so that my team Mm. can enjoy the gift of Sabbath. I, I, I just think we approach these books and these topics selfishly sometimes. I'm talking to mm-hmm. myself here, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm just trying to get in that habit of thinking, okay, I've got a lot of the stuff I can value, but how can I serve those underneath me on an org chart with these principles and these practices? Man, absolutely. And you know, you you mentioned Sabbath. That's actually clear, you know, in the, in yes. the, in the Sabbath that you're supposed to not, you know, you're not supposed to do any work. And then also your male and female slaves aren't to, and your yes. livestock and the alien resident, the, the, the immigrant. So yes. basically you're to make sure that everybody gets rest. Yes. Right? Sabbath is communal, but we're so hyper individualistic yeah. Yeah. these days that we, that we, that we can fail to see that. Well, so, so let me, you know, I, a very specific example. What can we do as a leader? So, you know, my boss, Michaela, and yeah. she is a, a wonderful leader. Every now and then we'll get a, an email from her on the weekend, but yeah. it will often have this little note at the top. You, you, you don't have to look at this till Monday. I love that. I and love she that. has said to us, you know, sometimes I, because she's a mom, young kids, since not, I'm, sometimes I'm going to have to work on the weekend. I do not expect you to work on weekends. Unless, of course, there's some crisis, in which case I'd make that clear. So there's just, so she's giving us freedom and permission. Yes. uh, And and, and that's just, I think, one example, but that's a really good example. That's a terrific example. I'll give you another one, right? So um, we we talked about this a few minutes ago, this idea of only checking email, Slack messages, whatever, a few times a day. Um, You as an employee can do that right now. You can go to your boss and say, hey, in an effort to better serve you in the work, From now on, with your permission, I'm only going to check my email four times a day. But as the leader, so there was a really interesting study done that found that something like 60% of employees expect, assume that their boss expects them to respond to messages immediately, Mm. even though the boss has never explicitly said that to be true. Mm. It's just this implicit, unspoken social contract. So if you're the leader... (laughs) <laughs> One of the ways you can radically bless your team right now in five minutes before we end this podcast, send an email to them and say, hey, guys, I've heard some of you guys recognize, assume that I expect you to respond to messages immediately. This email is letting you off the hook. 
From mm. now on, you have 24 business hours to respond to my emails. And if I need you more urgently, I'll call your cell. That'll change people's lives. You want to talk about how to retain people in the midst of the great resignation? That might be the simplest, most effective strategy you can deploy right now to change people's lives and radically increase the productivity of your organization. Jordan, I absolutely agree with you. And I also, but I also feel that there's this pushback from, not from the Bible, but, you know, from our culture, from some of these like non-biblical proverbs that we have in our culture (laughs) Mm -hmm. about time. For example, we have this saying that we repeat over and over again, time is money. (laughs) <laughs> and so how can we separate you know, or tease out the idea that, uh, time is money, always got to be working full tilt as hard as possible? You know, how would you mm. reframe that for, mm. for us? Yeah, I, I, I would just point to scripture itself. I mean, t- talking to, specifically about this hustle culture, time is money, always be working. The God of the Bible worked six days and rested one. Jesus himself observed the Sabbath. And actually, there's interesting data starting to come out that's showing the Sabbath, sleep, taking breaks throughout your day. On the surface, these things look terribly unproductive, but in reality, they are one of the most productive things you could possibly do. So rest is good for our goals and the work that we've set out before us. But as Christ followers, we also know that rest is good for our souls because it reminds us that when we're not productive, we're still beloved children of God. And God's purposes will not be thwarted if I sleep for eight hours every night. Mm. You know, I, I love that. And that's right on. Uh, Leah, the, the other thing I'd say, you, you asked about, well, what do we do with these sort of time is money messages and all that? You know, Jordan, one of the things you you really encourage us to do and guide us through is a process of really thinking through our lives in terms of what matters most, our mission and, and our yeah. our callings. And, and kind of only as you work through that stuff can you finally get clear on what your priorities ought to be. And so you're really giving us a, a, an alternative approach. So not just sort of accepting whatever the popular wisdom is, but really in, in a biblically grounded way, framing our lives and understanding who we are and what we're to do in light of, you know, who God is and what God has done in Christ and then what our part is. And so you, I just want to point that out, that that's, that's one of the main ways we can stand up, I think, uh, against mm-hmm. some of the messages that would um, take us in, in, in different and in negative directions. Well, yeah, I think I think one of the, overriding messages of our time is you do you, right? Yeah, like, right. You get to define the mess, the mission of your life. You get to define your purpose. There, there are so many books out there today and courses, what have you, uh, helping you craft a person, personal mission statement. Listener, let me let you off the hook right now. Uh, you could take all these books off your reading list. The mission of your life is to glorify God, period, full stop. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's a vision of your life. Now, you have great freedom. God in his goodness and his grace has given you great freedom into how exactly you're going to live that out. But that's your purpose. And so, Mark, you're talking about chapter four of Redeeming Your Time, where, you know, I'm helping readers prioritize their to-do list because a lot of people just look at the to-do list they have on their phone right now and say, how do I prioritize this thing? Mm -hmm. I think we got to go a few levels up before we can really answer that question. And so the metaphor I use is one of this five-story building, right? So imagine a five-story hotel. People come into the front door on the ground level and say, how do I prioritize my to-do list? You've got to get up into the elevator, go up to the top floor, that fifth floor, and work your way down. So the fifth floor is your mission right? Why you exist. You exist to glorify God. A level down from there, the fourth floor are callings. What are the unique expressions that you're going to choose to lean into to glorify God? So for me, my three primary callings are to my wife, right? To my kids and to my work as an entrepreneur. A level beneath that are long-term goals, which I would argue this is where you really start to get to prioritize that to-do list by setting bigger long-term goals. The second level are quarterly goals. 
And then the final level, the ground floor, is that day-to-day projects and next actions list, right? But you can't just start with the to-do list you got. You got to work your way up the elevator to really get clear on what you believe God's called you to chase after in this season of life. Hmm. Awesome. And I think for many people, when you're stuck in the, um, the onslaught of, oh, I guess I got to get so much done. I got to get so much done. You don't think that you can take a t- the time to yeah. ride that elevator yeah. <laughs> up to the fifth floor, you know, and look down. And um, I think uh, what your book does and certainly what God does through God's grace is give us the permission to say, look, take a step back. <laughs> it's going to be worth it in the end. You know, you have to break the cycle of um, always addressing what is urgent and never addressing what's important. Yeah, and this goes back to dissenting from the kingdom of noise. It's why Mm -hmm. this is chapter three before chapter four where you prioritize your to-do list. You can't prioritize your to-do list if your world is constantly noisy, right? Look Look at Jesus' example. He comes up out of the waters at his baptism, right? And the father speaks over him and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. If there was ever a moment where you would expect Jesus to stand up and start preaching, this is it, right? Yeah. It was an audible voice from the head that said, this is He's it. got an endorsement. He's got Let's an go endorsement. Right now. Let's go. Take advantage of it. But instead, the spirit leads Jesus to the wilderness for 40 days of quiet solitude. And it's only after those 40 days of quiet that he comes back and kicks off his ministry in earnest. Now, I don't want to say Jesus needed those. He's got in need those, but he took those 40 days of quiet before he really started that work in earnest. Man, we've got to do the same thing. If we want to get clear on what matters in our work, in our lives, it, we probably can't afford to take 40 days, but can you take a four hour retreat? To just be quiet and turn your phone off and stop consuming information to think and to pray and listen to the Spirit, I think we can all do that. You know, my friend Mark Batterson says, we spend more time planning a one-week vacation than we do the rest of our life. Yeah. Uh, that's convicting. And I think largely true for most of us. We've got to figure out how to be more proactive about setting these priorities. Jordan, I am so floor that you brought up this story of Jesus in the wilderness, because we've been talking a lot about the external distractions that come up that keep us from redeeming our time. But I think to me, this story also points to the internal distractions Mm. that we might face. So Jesus absolutely did, after his baptism, um, go into the wilderness and take 40 days. But it wasn't like a lovely meditation retreat. <laughs> well, he's right. literally tempted by the devil mm. in the wilderness. He has a very um, tough time mm. facing these temptations mm. in the wilderness. And I, you know, for me, when I sit in quiet time to a timer to 30 minutes, it can often be a tough time. It's not yeah. like, oh, this is so rejuvenative. You know, I feel fantastic. It's often I'm really um, staggered by the amount of distractions mm. internally mm. in my own brain, the fears that come up, the worries that come up, you know, all these internal things mm. are things I would like to run away from as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, it's really good. So there's a a section in the book um, called The Five Enemies of Depth at Work Mm -hmm. and at Home. And by depth, I mean the ability to be fully focused on one important person or thing at a time, right? So for in in that example, Leah, being focused on God's work. And so external distractions are only one of those five. The other Mm -hmm. four are largely internal distractions, right? The distraction to do fake instead of real productivity because fake things are easier, right? The distraction of quick highs and the dopamine rush of checking my Instagram likes. Uh, The distraction of the savior complex, which if I'm honest, might be the most tempting for me, right? We complain about getting a lot of emails or getting a lot of texts or whatever, But I think in a way we love them because they make us feel Mm. important and they make us feel needed. And then the last internal distraction, I think, is this makeshift omnipresence, this 
idea that we have sold ourselves that we can multitask, we can mentally be in more than one place at a time. It's an attempt to grasp at being God, <laughs> of being in multiple places at once, because he's the only one who's truly omnipresent. So yes, external distractions, we got to wrestle them to the ground. But Leah, you're so wise to point out that there are so many more internal distractions that we got to be cognizant of and do battle with. And this is, I love that you put it in these terms because this is the same thing that Jesus was wrestling Hmm. with in the desert. So you've yeah. convinced me, Jordan, now that Jesus did not have less to deal with. Than to deal with okay, because he was actually confronted by the devil. So I'm 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 on your page now that we can use Jesus as an, as an example. But you know, Satan was tempting him with the same thing. Like yeah. Satan was saying, "You be God." Yeah, yeah. You know, you turn these stones to bread. You know, and Jesus answered, "You know, that's not for me to do." I mean, yeah. what he literally answered was, man should not live by on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, But he's Jesus asserted to Satan three times, it's not me who's going to do it. Mm. It's not man mm. who can do it. It's God mm. who can do these things. And I think that the temptation just of you named is just the same. Mm. I want to take over mm. God's work mm. um, because that seems more... Manageable. I would have more control over it if I took over God's work. And that's just not going to lead any of us into a place of peace. Mm. Yeah, it's a failure to recognize what we see all throughout scripture. I am, I'm thinking of 1 Chronicles 29, 12 in particular. David's talking to his son Solomon. And he says, hey, son, wealth and honor come from God alone for he rules over everything. In other words, you're not going to produce results for this nation as your king. God alone produces results through our work. Now, we hustle. He often does that through our hustle, through our hard work. But he's responsible for the results. And that's the truth that enables us to rest in a radically different way than the rest of the world. The rest of the world, non-believers, are told, hustle, hustle, hustle. Everything's up to you, right? The Christian faith says, everything's up to God. So we got to be faithful. We got, and that requires doing the work, but faithfulness also requires trusting in God and resting. John Piper says, God's job is fruitfulness. My job is faithfulness. That's the idea. I love that. And I feel like that's a good last word <laughs> <laughs> to end on. Jordan, one last question for you. You know, yeah. when you, when, People meet you or, you know, you think of how, what your legacy is. Do you want to be seen as a productive person or do you want to be seen as a present person? Do you want to be seen Mm. as a purposeful person? I mean, what is your, what is your highest ambition for yourself in your work here? Mm. Man, I want to be seen as all those things. Um, Mm. I want to be seen as all those things at work and at home. You know, when I think about my mission, though, and the legacy I want to leave my kids, the Capital C Church, I want to help Christians respond in many different ways to the radical yet biblical truth that the work they do matters for eternity. Mm -hmm. And redeeming your time is just one expression of that. If you believe that as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, that the work you do today is not in vain, you should care about redeeming your time and doing more work with excellence and love and in accordance with the Lord's commands that's gonna work forever, right? That's gonna last forever. So that's what I wanna be, quote unquote, no, I don't know that I wanna be known, honestly, but if I, if I am known for one thing, yeah, it's helping Christians respond to that radical truth that their work matters forever. And that includes redeeming the time because the days are evil. Mm. Mm. Well, Jordan, thank you for spending some of your time on, with us today. It's really been a pleasure. Yes, yeah, it's indeed. Been my, it's been thank my you. treat. Thank you, Mark and Leah. That's our show. Don't miss the next episode. Be sure to subscribe. And if you like what you've heard, please leave a review. We'd love to hear from you. And it helps other people find us. Thanks for listening. 